Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Rani and here at the Halifax International Security Forum in Nova Scotia, Canada, one of the world's truly great security conferences here in the maritime province uh, of this great nation. Our coverage here is sponsored by Boeing and Leonardo DRS, and it's my honor to be talking to a uh, great American journalist, Jason Rosian of the Washington Post. Uh, you were uh, a hostage, uh, unfortunately, for 18 months, uh, or a guest, as the Iranians kept saying, of the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran. Um, I don't want to get into the settlement, congratulations, but I know that there's a lot of work to do on that, so I want to uh, move uh, straight to the issue of what's going on in Iran right now. It's an extraordinary time, a lot of turmoil, a lot of demonstrations, gas prices going up. Talk to us a little bit about the dynamic that we're seeing here, and what are the potential implications? Because everybody sees a moment like this and they think democracy is around the corner, but maybe not. Well, I, I, I would first of all like to say that, that I hope and uh, wish that Iranians survive this period of time because it's been incredibly brutal the last few days. Uh, the internet was shut down so that we can't get really clear images or insight onto what's happening inside the country right now. But from what we do know, thousands of people came out into the streets over the past few days to demonstrate against government policies. We've known for a very long time that large portions of that country don't want uh, an Islamic theocracy running the show any longer. Uh, but it's been a very um, tense situation for years, and it's come to a boil. It's come to a boil multiple times, especially since 2009. And I think this is the biggest uh, outburst of, of protest and angst that we've seen since then. I don't think you can fully bottle it back up. So, you know, my take on Iran for a long time has been uh, that the prospects, the long-term prospects, are very good. It's a well-educated country with a lot of democratic tendencies, a lot of um, interaction between Iranians and the outside world going back many centuries, but also in recent years. Um, so, you know, it, it's a matter of reconnecting to the outside world. Uh, unfortunately, policies of the U.S. in recent years have made that more difficult in a lot of ways through the travel ban, through other sorts of sanctions. But ultimately, uh, my bet is always with the people of Iran. Um, how, you know, there was this uh, sense that the Iran nuclear deal was going to kind of free assets, was going to be the kind of thing that was going to drive Iran more yeah. toward uh, democracy at the end of the day, certainly slow down the nuclear program. Iran now, um, I mean, obviously the United States is pulling out of it. President Trump has said he wants to get a better deal than that deal, remains uncertain what will happen. How does that dynamic play out? What's the next thing? I mean, the gas centrifuges, uh, Iran is starting to run again. We were in uh, Dubai last week for the air show and an international air chiefs conference, and everybody was talking about how tensions are rising in the region. You know, how important was the nuclear deal? How important was backing out of the nuclear deal? And now what's the next step and what leverage does the international community have? I don't think right now we can really assess how important the deal was, but we can assess how important and how uh, critical it was to come out of the deal. I think by coming out of it, uh, we lost a deal that was working to cur curtail their nuclear ambitions. We know that much. Was it slowing them down in their other terrible behavior in the region? No. It wasn't specifically designed to do that. Um, and I think you know there was hope that it would lead to that, but we didn't have enough of a sample period to know if that would happen or not. I would say that uh, Iran tried to extend its influence during this period of time, and successfully so. Um, so ultimately, I think we've lost a certain amount of credibility uh, with our international allies when we make a deal uh, with other countries and spend years uh, negotiating that deal in tandem with our closest allies and then all of a sudden step away from it. What does that say about America's word? That's one issue. But more importantly, uh, you know, what is the 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 impact on the Middle East as a whole right now. Iran doesn't seem to be stepping back in any way, even though their economy is in, in tatters. It's a dominant force in that region, culturally, militarily, and strategically, and it has been since the beginning of time, right? Uh, so uh, we shouldn't expect that to change overnight, and I think we have to look, to ways, look for ways to rein them in uh, and engage with them on some level, whatever that level is, however uh, measured it should be, we can't have no communication with them. Um, you know, and, and you didn't add also culturally, right? I mean, the enormous power of Iranian culture in the region. Is that something you think that Americans have a tendency of forgetting? 
that Iran is a very, very proud nation, sees itself as culturally different and unique, and has been a regional superpower for 3,500 years. I don't think Americans forget that. I think they never knew it in the first place. And um, it's important for us to look back at history, ancient history and more recent history. This is one of our closest allies in the world less than 50 years ago. Uh, they've continued to dominate in cultural fields despite having one of the most censored uh, media and culture landscapes in the entire world. Still there at the forefront of cinema, photography, other forms of art. Uh, and that filters into their neighboring countries. As you know, uh, traveling to that region and having roots there, uh, Iran is not a force that can be ignored by its neighbors, whether it's economic, whether it's cultural, whether it's militarily, and we shouldn't try to box them out of the situation either. Um, I, I don't want to seem like I'm uh, becoming a lawyer for Iran on this, but one of the other things I think that American officials, I, I want to get your take on whether or not we're looking at this the right way, because from an Iranian perspective, they're the defenders of Shias who are beset upon whether they're in Lebanon where they're a minority, whether they're in Iraq where they're a majority but didn't have the power. How powerful a role does that play? Nobody is condoning the role and the way that Iran plays this power, but how powerful a, a strain of thinking is that from the standpoint of the Iranian leadership? Well, I think it fortifies their own narrative, right? And they've cultivated this image of themselves as the defenders of all Shias. And frankly, they started off saying we're the defenders of all Muslims. That wasn't playing out very well uh, with their, no, not really, <laughs> with their Sunni brethren in in the Gulf or uh, you know further uh, west in the Middle East. Um, so you know, I, I think overall, it's it's fortified that that stance. It's also uh, entrenched that thinking among the top leadership of the regime. Uh, and, and we've seen it right now over the last few weeks, the really coalescing of forces with inside the regime. As you know, uh, you know, a, a, despite being an authoritarian state, domestic politics in a country as, uh, as old as Iran uh, is a, a very ripe and fertile ground. There's always jockeying for more position, more power, and there's a range of views. Well, we don't see that range of views right now. All we see is all of them coming together, standing in lockstep with one another, saying, we're going to stand up, defend our country's borders, uh, even if that means shooting our own citizens in the head. Do you think that who, so in the event that there is an over, so what do you think the prospects are of an overthrow? And is there something, is there somebody better who takes over? Or is it another Ayatollah that's actually as bad as the a gang of characters that are in charge now? I, personally, I don't think that there's an eminent threat to the, the mm, structure of the Islamic Republic. It's been sustaining blows since the day it started 40 years ago. It'll continue to sustain blows. But what's different now is that you have cross-sections of the society protesting um, for different reasons, but at the same time. And I think that trend is going to continue and continue and continue. And at some point, we won't have to deal with the Islamic Republic anymore. But in the short term, uh, whether Ayatollah Khamenei dies um, or there's other, some other sort of internal overthrow, I, I don't see the prospects for uh, a better leadership uh, coming from within right now. And I also, uh, very frankly, don't see uh, a single person in the diaspora uh, that shows uh, the right kind of tendencies that might lead Iran to a better future. That person doesn't exist. Uh, do you, is there, I mean, I know that Rafsanjani, for example, or Rouhani have been seen as, you know, these were like liberalizing figures, but that's not entirely true because each one of these guys has their own political, right? I mean, they're politicians who are trying to get elected in a crowded field. I mean, that's how Ahmadinejad got, got elected, uh, not, not as a reformer, uh, clearly. But are there any reformers who are on the scenes uh, aside from these names that we've occasionally heard and obviously Rafsanjani passed? I don't think that you can really put a lot of stock into any of these people. My argument has always been that um, folks like Rafsanjani and, and um, Rouhani were not going to be great liberalizers in terms of society and culture, but they would liberalize the economy and open it up to foreign investment. And ultimately, that would be the driver of change. They realized, uh, dating back to the 1980s with Rafsanjani, that they couldn't sustain uh, an oil economy that was heavily subsidizing every aspect of its citizens' lives. And they need to move away from that. 
Uh, they also realize that they have a, a young and educated population that has aspirations, and if those aspirations aren't met, at some point they're going to rise up to, against them. This is not about, you know, uh, Jeffersonian Democrats or anything like that. It's about, you know, cold, hard pragmatism and the reality that you have a strong, able-bodied, large population that's very uh, intelligent and industrious, and they should be allowed to flourish um, for the for their own well-being, but also for the growth uh, of that nation, whatever the leadership is. Um, uh, let me, a uh, couple of uh, uh, questions. One is on the nuclear program. Um, one of the things that, you know, yes, not only is the country culturally powerful, but it's also technologically remarkably sophisticated. Time and again, there's been an underestimation of what the Iranians would be able to do and to develop. I've been guilty of underestimating what they've been able to develop, certainly. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. So how perilously close could we be to a breakout capability, given that um, you know, I Iran is technologically very sophisticated and that know-how still exists within Iran. Well, I, I think that it's something to watch and that's the reason why w the deal was so important to have international monitors uh, inside the country at all times and having access uh, whenever they needed it to, to all of their locations. In the absence of that, I don't know how we check against the, the possibility of breaking out. All we have is a very flimsy proclamation by the Supreme Leader that you know nuclear weapons are against our religion. Now, you and I have both heard a lot of discussion of that fatwa and the, the validity or relevance of it. Um, I wouldn't say that it's valid in a court of law, but at the same time, um, you know, the the... The question of his legitimacy, if they were to do a 180 on that, is something that no one's ever been able to properly explain to me. And I think he would take a real, real blow with the public, with the international community, and, you know, frankly, face uh, attack from, uh, from the United States and others uh, if it were to appear as though Iran was getting that close. Did you... Did you do do you think they had secret facilities, right? I mean, one of the claims by the U.S. administration is there were facilities we didn't know about that international inspectors were not inspecting. I, I don't want to speculate on that because I don't know. And as somebody who lived there for five years, I was never I mean, working as a journalist. They would open up facilities to journalists from time to time. I was never among the journalists that were allowed into those facilities. Uh, so it's really hard to say. Um, but you also realize that Iranians like people of any uh, where in the world have loose lips and there's a lot of interaction between the West and Iran, uh, citizens traveling back and forth. You'd think we'd know about something like that if it existed. Um, what, what do you think is key to deterring uh, Iran at the end of the day, right? I mean, uh, again, we were in Dubai. Uh, some of the Emirati officials were very try to tamp tensions down. It's important for us to hang together, but it's very important for us not to have conflict. Um, do you think that conflict can will be averted there? I think it'll be averted. I hope it'll be averted. Uh, but I think we have to figure out a way to um, to put pressure on the regime, but enable the people of Iran. That's the recipe that we haven't figured out yet. Every measure of pressure that we've implemented that was directed at the regime has had more of a negative impact than on the than on the people than it ever has on the regime. And I don't see us changing course on that anytime soon. Partially in large part because we don't have real good insight into what's going on inside that country. We don't have diplomatic relations for a lot of different reasons, but we've cut off all other kinds of ties as well. So, you know, it's, it's a tough nut to crack. Iran is obviously um, mostly responsible for this situation, but we're not aiding in, uh, in empowering uh, democratic movements inside Iran. I, I have not seen a single piece of evidence that we are. Um, and uh, uh, two last questions. Do internet, I mean, there was a $180 million settlement. I'm not going to ask you to talk about it. But do judgments like that actually factor at all into Tehran's calculus on anything? I think that they will have to at some point because if they ever wanted to make uh, amends with, with the United States or other countries, those judgments are like a lien on a house, right? Um, and I, I think for me, um, you know, finding a small modicum of justice was really important. Um, but at the same time, deterring them from doing this to others, which they've been doing constantly uh, over the last 40 years, but you know, with more fervor over the last two or three years, figuring out a way to stop them from doing this and, and make it more costly than beneficial um, is ultimately the goal. Um, on your book, uh, came out in January, paperback? 
end of January 2020, and uh, and I'll be doing a, a narrative podcast, and uh, awesome. yeah, with the with the Crooked Media guys, and uh, uh, yes, the, the fake news team is yes. uh, is hard at it, uh, and who knows, there might be a. Uh, television show or motion picture. We're talking to Denzel Washington about uh, playing me in that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think I think that would work. I think that I think See that's it? great. Very yeah. Expressive face. You know, <laughs> happy, sad, everything. Jason Rezaian of the Washington you, Post, award-winning uh, journalist who was uh, a guest of the Iranian Republic. Let's call it what it was: a hostage uh, at the at the hands of a brutal regime. Thank you so much for Thanks. spending time with Thanks. us. Really appreciate it. Khod- appreciate it. Khod- <laughs>